Welcome back to PlayStation Live from E3. I'm joined by Ryan Clements, Pete from Bethesda, and John from Tango. And we are here to talk about The Evil Within 2. Hey. Yay, more scary <laughs> game. <laughs> okay, so uh, Sebastian is back. So give us a little bit of um, a, a summary of what people can expect in this game. I mean, The Evil Within 2 starts uh, not long after the events of the, of the first game. And it's basically Sebastian at rock bottom. <laughs> Uh, since the events of the first game, his life has kind of completely fallen apart. Nobody really believes him and what he says took place in the asylum. Um, he's become an alcoholic and he's basically at, at the bottom of the barrel. When so if it wasn't bad enough that he had to go through everything in the first one, now say, it's like, yeah. how can we make oh, it worse? worse. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it's definitely worse. And, and, and that's really where you, you, you find Sebastian when Kidman, his old partner from the first game, comes back and says, uh, the daughter that you thought was dead that you had lost years ago isn't dead. Uh, Mobius has her, they're using her, and you need to go in and find her and get here, get her. And it's a, it's a redemption story. It's a chance for him to kind of pick himself up and use finding her to like start to rebuild his life and put himself back together. It's a lot of lighthearted material. Yeah, so uh, Ryan, it's, it's the, not that bad. You, you know, your standard scared, go into right. a kind of quasi virtual reality to find the daughter you thought was dead story. You know, lighthearted, you know. nice, <laughs> few chuckles, it'll be great. Nice family friendly yeah. material. Um, what are some of the lessons you guys and Tango learn from the first Evil Within that you feel like you're bringing in with the sequel? Well, one of the things uh, we saw was we definitely wanted to have a game that focused more on characters, more on story. And we put a lot of effort this time. Sebastian is coming back. He's a much more relatable character. And you get to really journey with him from the beginning of the game to the end and see his evolution as a character. And like Pete said, it's a redemption story, so you really get the quality out of there. Yeah. I, I, think that, I think it's a big one, which is in the first game, Sebastian's kind of a jerk. And, and his whole motivation is he shows up and the police get called to this thing and he's a detective, but there's no like, there's no pull or like sort of relatable moments where you kind of empathize with him. It's like, it sucks for you and it sucks yeah. for him because you're both getting scared and both trying not to die. Whereas this time around, because you see him so kind of broken down, um, by, by what happened in the first game, and you sort of understand the connection between a father and his daughter and, and that motivation. He, I think he's much more relatable. Uh, yeah, and he has that around. drive this time to go further. Yeah. Like he knows what, what he's doing this for. The stakes are a lot higher this yeah, time around. Yeah. So this, uh, this game, from what I've seen, uh, feels a little more like a psychological horror than all, just, you know, scary and gory and jump scares. Seems a lot more psychological. For sure. I mean, uh, John can probably speak yeah. to it, but it, it, it's, always a, it's always a blend. Yeah, there's definitely jump scares in there. There will be Damn more, it. but um, <laughs> like you said, I think especially what you see in the trailer and when you see in the gameplay, there is that psychological element that we sort of brought up a little bit in this one, and players will definitely see that when they play it. Yeah, no, it, like, don't get the wrong idea. It's not like, um, not that there's anything wrong with Saw, but it's not like Saw the video game. It's not just nonstop blood and Pack dismemberment and, and, and guts. It turns out there's a lot of ways to scare people and make it off-putting. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the game is, like, if you don't like being scared at all, well, there's no chance you should play the Evil Within 2 <laughs> because you definitely will get well, scared. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to talk through it. Exactly. Uh, but, but you don't actually have to like survival horror or be a survival horror fan to like this kind of game because I think of the stuff that John's talked about, the team has really tried to focus on it. It really actually started with the DLC for the original Evil Within where they did some things with the, the Kidman DLC the story and the narrative there that people really took to, and I think they kind of used that as a launching pad for this one. So, yeah. you know, if you like action games or good story, and yeah, sure, it's going to be scary and there's going to be tense combat, but you, you don't have to be, well, if you don't love survival horror, this game isn't for you. Um, although, obviously, that is the big audience that I think will this will appeal to. If you like Shinji's work, if you like Tango's work, this is going to be right in your wheelhouse. There's a, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said, and one of those is, you know, the kind of mantra of survival horror, and that is the foundation is the core of what the evil within is all about. And, you know, with the sequel, survival horror is known for a lot of things. I, I often think about, when I hear survival horror, I think about, like, resources, item management, you know, trying to get from one moment to the next and being smart about it when you're also scared out of your mind. <laughs> How do you guys balance all those disparate elements together in the evil within 2? Well, it just takes a lot of time. But, <laughs> time but is yeah, everything. Balance is everything in a survival horror game, right? Because like you said, it's resource management, which is such a key element to playing through this game. 
Um, and in this one, that remains. You know, we didn't, we didn't sacrifice that for sort of going through these big action pieces. It really is about exploring this world and finding anything that you can find and take craft together to make it to the next area, to make it to the next step. And, uh, you know, it's, it's tough, yeah. What and, kind and of I think, weapons I think, the, I think the other thing that, that John and the team really focus on is that notion that a survival horror game can't just be terrifying nonstop, right? Yes. Like, it, you yeah. put a player into that kind of environment, like, after two hours, you're just desensitized yeah. to all of it. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. something just, like, it's all horrifying, it's all terrible, like, whatever, I'm scared. But I, I think what, <laughs> what, what, what Tango does really well is not only figuring out that balance of resources, but that balance of intensity. Like, if you, it turns out if you give the player time to breathe or to get a little story or to talk to somebody yeah. about a side mission, you're actually setting up the game that much better so that those scary moments can be scary. Yeah. And I think that's a skill that these guys have that it, it, you don't really appreciate until you until you play it. And it's not even a survival horror thing, but I think it's it's even more important in survival horror than a lot of other. Absolutely, you give the player a minute to think like, everything's gonna be okay, everything's gonna be Never just okay. fine. Never. And then, ah, it comes Never. right and back at you. It's so not okay. Yeah, and so and not okay. Just I, I love the weapons that are, are always available and the different things that you can kill the, the, the scary monsters with. Um, will we see a lot more of that in uh, the second one? Yeah, so you're obviously your standard, your your shotgun, your handgun are, are back in full force. And you can see in our gameplay trailer that there is the crossbow from the original game returning. Um, so it gives you an opportunity to sort of uh, use that as a, a tactical weapon to take down enemies. But even uh, the sneak aspect is is in there. So you don't have to use guns to take down enemies. You can you can hide, you can sneak kill, take them out in one, in one shot from behind. So there's lots of options available to you, especially to suit the play style that you like to play. Yeah. Yeah. Good, there's stealth options. So that Good, makes so you can me, just hide. That makes me feel a little bit better. As the hiding scaredy cat, I'm glad <laughs> yes, you catered. Yes, you can hide. hide. Yeah. Hiding scaredy cat mode is available. Okay. <laughs> it's one, it's like normal, hard, but then if you go all the way to the top, it's hiding scaredy cat. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know you guys probably get asked this a lot, but you know, I feel like there's a lot of cyclical elements to how the East and West do horror and how they kind of have learned from each other over time. I mean, with The Evil Within 2, it's, it has sort of a Western feel, but it's deeply driven by sort of an Eastern and Japanese horror aesthetic. I mean, what is the direction like this time around? Is it following that path? Do you feel like there's more Western influences as well? Well, we never set out from the beginning and say, hey, let's make like a Western-themed horror game. I think uh, it's because the team is, is obviously mostly Japanese. Um, there is that uh, sense of the Japanese horror in there. And I think that really comes out with the enemy design. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, but some of the locations, we did get a lot of inspiration from some Western-themed places. Like uh, the stage itself is a, a kind of American town well, compared to the first game, which kind of had a maybe European influence. Right. Um, this time we went in a little bit in that direction. But there are some things that we haven't shown which go into a completely different direction, which I'm sure you more, more crazy <laughs> horror that I can't stand. Yeah. Well, and how do you guys come up with new ways to scare people over yeah. and over? You know, because, you know, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a sequel. We've already kind of seen, like, oh, no, he's going to jump out of here or there. Um, so how do you guys, you know, brainstorm and come up with new ways I, to scare, I, the, I think, scare the pants the, off us? Maybe the most fun part of, of working with Tango on the Evil Within and then now the Evil Within 2 is, like, team meetings where, where they're, like, you know, like every dev that we meet with, the, the end of it is usually like, hey, we're going to show you some art or some screenshots or some concepts. And whenever we get to the creature stuff, <laughs> the, the, the U.S. end of that call is always like, what the hell is wrong with you guys? Like, who comes up with that? Like, what kind of nightmares are you who having? Who are that, you? Yeah, it, it's unbelievable that like just... We're happy with yeah, that. But yeah, yeah, yeah that yes. they, like, it, they just never tap the well completely dry, that there's always some god-awful monstrosity that somebody has come up with that is going to be yeah. shambling at you, running at you, screaming at you, whatever it is. There's always something to be afraid of. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Why do you feel like horror it just resonates with so many people? And, of course, as this game and, and Bethesda indicates, it's, cro it's cross-cultural, right? It's just, like, completely universal. There's something almost addictive about it. I know. I grew up watching horror movies. Like, I grew up on survival horror as a genre. So... It was a weird feeling for me because you never wanted to play, but you wanted to play because yeah. you knew you were going to get scared. And there's that thrill of that. It's that, that fear of, of dying. Even though it is a game, it's like you really attach to the character and your progression. So it's, yeah, that intrinsic feeling of there's risk, but not really. It, it certainly is a genre that lends itself to like that, that little bit of an adrenaline rush almost, right? And, and one of the things that I think that, that you know, I found a lot of in The Evil Within was how thrilling it can be and how tense it can be to to run away 
Like, when you have something that's totally. chasing you and, like, I'm not going to shoot it. There's no weak points for me to take out. I don't have, like, some big chain gun to kill this. I just have to run away and not die. And you get to the end of that hallway or you get away from that thing. You go crashing through a door and, and you realize, like, oh, my God, I didn't die. Like, that was intense. And all you actually did was run away. Like, you didn't actually, like, damage it, do anything to it, outsmart it. You just ran. But, like... When you finish that moment, you have this, your, your, your pulse is going and your heart's beating like, wow, yeah. that was intense. Like, holy crap. And it's almost like a little bit of a drug. You're like, all right, okay. All right, I think I'm ready to do it again. <laughs> and you get that feeling again and sort of pacing those out, I think, is, is to John's point. Like, that's, that's what's fun about horror in general and with video games in, in specific is that, like, doing very little can be such an intense experience and give you a feeling that you can't necessarily get in a shooter or an RPG or in other things the same way. Yeah, like in a game like this, probably the scariest thing is just like a closed door. Yeah. Because you don't know what's there and you know you have to go in there and you know probably something bad is waiting, but you don't know. But that's, that anticipation there is that, th that thrill, that adrenaline yeah, rush. Yeah, and you know, about. John was talking about like the time that they need to, to iterate and to work on stuff. I will tell you the thing they need no practice on is the speed with which Sebastian opens a door. <laughs> like they have found the most unsettling formula for the speed at which it opens and the crack at every single time it's like, oh, like, oh, no, you have that sort <laughs> yeah. of like at the movies, right? Like, don't go yeah. on the door, get out of the house. What are you doing? Like the way they have Sebastian open doors and like it, it hasn't really changed since the first game. It's the most unsettling speed and camera perspective I've ever seen in a game. At this point, he should just, just you know, just that take it right down. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. I have I have a quick suggestion before we close off the segment. OK, at some point, you should just disable the pause feature in the game when during a big scare moment. And that way, the per person can't hide behind a pause menu. That's a good idea. So you can take <laughs> that right back to the studio. <laughs> That's free. You can take it. And don't do that to the normal mode. OK, I yeah. Have my, <laughs> you're like super difficult. <laughs> super, enough, but I no pausing. Pause, no, nothing. You know Nothing's don't, in yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's so great. I think we all play, you know, video games for the interactivity of it. And there's such a visceral response that you get from horror. And, you know, when your heart starts to race and, and you actually have the reaction to that game. And you guys do that so well. So thank you so much for coming and sharing Evil Thanks Within. Thanks for having, having us. us. Yeah. Oh, it's our yes, pleasure. Really awesome. All right, guys. Evil Within 2, definitely stay tuned to the PlayStation blog. We'll have a lot more about that coming out. We're going to October 13th, right? Is that October, what we're saying? Uh, Friday the 13th of Friday October. Friday the 13th. <laughs> yes. It's like awesome. you that one out. It turned out <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, stick around. We've got a a lot more from PlayStation live at E3. PlayStation.